chemical situations or industrial situations, the particles are rarely spherical. So how great an influence did that, does that have? And perhaps I'll address that later in the talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking about particles that in their action with one another are interacting in, in pairs. In the jargon of the subject, they're interacting through binary collisions. So the collisions are instantaneous and occur only between two particles at a time. Uh, and again, that's a, an assumption that is violated in many uh, realistic situations. So we can talk about the consequences of the violation of that, of that uh, assumption. And I'm going to be talking about dense flows because in the, in, for dense flows, we can obtain a kinetic theory without having to go through the process of solving for the velocity distribution functions that govern the likelihood of particles colliding. Um, in a dense, in a dense uh, flow of granular materials, the majority of the transfer of momentum and the transfer and dissipation of energy occurs through collisions. And by taking into account only those collisional transfers, we can make use of a very simple uh, statistical description of the flow. So when I say kinetic theory, I'm talking about a theory that is developed by first considering the interaction between pairs of particles, and then the, uh, putting forward simple probabilistic assumptions about the likelihood of those collisions in order to get a macroscopic continuum theory. So we go from, an, from the study of interaction of two particles to a continuum description of the flow. So just to have a concrete example in mind, a very common a very common flow is flow of a granular material down an inclined plane that, let's say, is rough. So here I imagine the base of the incline being roughened by particles, attaching particles, perhaps similar to those of the flow, to the base. And then above the base, we have a certain depth of particles that, uh, that are flowing. And perhaps there's a, there's a velocity profile. Actually, the velocity profile probably looks more like that. There's a velocity profile having to do with the description of the, of the mean velocity of these particles. And if we look at the situation, if we look at the situation more closely, what we have are particles that simply by virtue of the centers of the particles having different, different mean motions, we, uh, we have particles driven. Into, into collisions with one another. So for example, because the, the mean velocity of this particle is greater than the one below it, inevitably there's going to be a collision. That collision is going to create velocity fluctuations. And it turns out that these, both the average velocity and the fluctuations in velocity are important because the fluctuation velocities play an important role in determining the collision frequency. Okay, so that's, a, uh, that's more or less the, the story that I'm going to be talking about. So we're interested in a gravitational flow, perhaps, over some angle. It's uh, inclined to the horizontal. A certain depth of particles uh, are being fed in, let's say, at some, upper, at some upper end. And we'd like to describe in a continuum way, much in the same way that if this were a a liquid, we would use the Navier-Stokes equations to describe the velocity profile of the resulting, perhaps, steady flow. We'd like to describe this, this inclined flow using the macroscopic equations that we derive from this simple kinetic theory. Okay, so that's kind of where we're going. So that involves the points that I talk about here. So first we talk about two spheres and characterize the momentum and energy in a collision between two spheres, taking into account that in a collision between macroscopic spheres, as opposed to 
molecules in a collision between macroscopic spheres, let's say made of quartz or silica, energy is inevitably lost in the collision. That is, there's a coefficient of restitution that is less than one. Okay? There's also, there's also the possibility that the rotation of the particles influence the collisions, and we would have to describe uh, perhaps an analog of the normal coefficient of restitution, a tangential coefficient of restitution, or introduce a coefficient of sliding friction. But that tangential interaction, at least in the first step, I'm going to ignore. So we're going to be talking about frictionless spheres interacting in a, in a way that involves dissipation, in a way that involves a, a coefficient of restitution less than one, but for simplicity, I'm going to restrict the energy loss in the collision to be not so great. So the coefficient of restitution is less than 1, but we'll suppose it's near 1. Let's say 0.85. Okay? So that's what I mean by nearly elastic spheres. Okay, so the first thing we'll talk about is a collision between two spheres. All right, then we're going to talk about these probabilistic ideas that characterize how likely the collision between two spheres is. Um, and then the, the combination of the characterization of the momentum and energy exchanged in a single collision and these probabilistic ideas, oops, and these probabilistic ideas is going to allow us to calculate the, the stress tensor, the, the energy flux, and something that is called the rate of collisional dissipation. And so we'll have, eventually, balance equations for mass, or a continuity equation, a balance equation for average velocity of the particles, and an equation for the, the energy of the velocity fluctuations. And I say we need that measure of the energy of the velocity fluctuations because the collision frequency depends upon it. Okay? So here's... Oh wait, so let's see. So we get... So we get and and having, having those constitutive relations and, and also having balance laws that, that uh, involve those quantities determined by constitutive relations, we can phrase and solve boundary value problems that will lead us to the fields uh, that are involved in an incline flow. Okay, so nomenclature. Uh, we're going to denote the mass of a sphere by m, the diameter of the sphere by sigma. And I have to apologize for, the, for some of this notation because this is notation that is that is borrowed, that is taken from the kinetic theory for for molecular gases. Um, so diameter particle sigma, the position of the center of the particle, vector r, velocity of the particle, the particle center, uh, lowercase c, bold, and the external force on the particle is related to the acceleration of the particle and the mass of the particle in the usual, the usual way. Okay, so nothing so mysterious here except perhaps using sigma for the diameter of the particle. So now what I want to do, uh, no, I should say, by way of apology, that, that kinetic theory is complicated. That's the, that's the problem with it. It involves uh, rather extensive integrations when you're, when you're calculating uh, quantities for the stress and the, and the, uh, the energy flux. Okay, so I apologize in advance for the complications. Uh, I'll be putting the, the PDFs of what you're seeing here online, and we'll try to make them available to you. Uh, and also there's a paper that Stuart Savage and I wrote in which the calculations are given in more detail. Uh, so that will be available to you. And if any of you want to follow the talk by carrying out the calculations, I would be happy to talk to you about them if you'd like some, some advice. Okay, but here's a simple calculation. We're looking at two spheres impacting one another, and uh, 
uh, we're denoting the velocity of the, the first sphere, the vector velocity of the first sphere after collision with the prime, it's the velocity before the collision, unprimed, and j is the impulse exerted by particle one on particle two, and then focusing on particle two, we have a similar equation with the change in sign of the impulse uh, that, uh, describes, that describes the motion before and after the collision. Okay, so now what we'd like to do is we'd like to, we'd like to close these equations. That is, we'd like to determine the impulse J in terms of the velocities before the collision and, as it turns out, a, a single parameter uh, in order to talk about, for example, the exchange of momentum, to the, the momentum of a, of a particle in this collision and the change of energy of the, of the two particles in a collision. So we introduce a, the relative velocity, the velocity of particle one relative to particle two here after the collision. And that relative velocity along the, a unit vector, the line of centers. So here we have two particles in the collision, uh, particle one, particle two. Uh, we've got a unit vector from the center, center of particle one to the center of particle two, and uh, and we relate the we relate the the velocity uh, of the or the relative velocity after the collision along the line of centers to the relative velocity uh, of the collision before. So let's see. So we've got a velocity c here. And let's say a velocity c1 here. Does it look like those two particles are going to co collide with those components of velocity? Let me make it more plausible. Okay, so here's this coefficient of restitution then. That is, not all of the of the magnitude of the, of, the, of the incoming velocity is recovered by the outgoing velocity. So the, the coefficient of restitution being less than 1, greater than 0, uh, tells us how much of this velocity is recovered. Uh, and with this additional, with this additional uh, relation between the relative velocities before and after collision, we can solve these two equations for the impulse. Okay, so if you want to prep do a first calculation, there's the first calculation you could do is determine uh, from these from these conditions the expression for for the impulse. Okay, and given the expression for the impulse, then we can calculate various quantities associated with the collision. So certainly we could calculate the the change in momentum as being the uh, let's say the change in momentum of particle one uh, in a collision, but we're we're focusing here on an example that uh, that de that determines the change in total energy of the two particles be before the, uh, the the change in the total energy of the two particles. So here again, a calculation based upon the use of the expression for the impulse in, the, in these formulas for the velocity before and after the collision gives rise to an explicit expression for the loss, minus sign, of energy in the collision. And of course, that involves the coefficient of restitution. OK, so, so without any problem here, we've solved this rather elementary dynamics problem in order to determine the the, the change in energy in a collision, and we could also deal with the change in momentum of either particles experienced in a collision. Okay, so that's fine. So now we have to say something about how likely collisions between particles are in a flow. And that's going to involve a, a, a means of calculating averages that is, that is based upon a velocity distribution function. So the idea is that 
we introduce a function that is a function not only of velocities, but also is parameterized by position and time, uh, so that the number of particles per, per unit volume uh, in physical space is given by the integral of this velocity distribution over a volume in velocity space. I mean, this is not so, so mysterious, uh, but this is the means by which we're going to carry out averaging. So at a point in space, so at a point in space, we're going to have a distribution of velocity that tells us what the, what the likelihood is of a particle, or let's say, uh, well, what the, what the likelihood is of a particle having a specific component of velocity. So, so you're yes. saying at a given point in space, you can have particles which can have velocities from over the entire range. Well, that's the idea, and the, and the way we would get the average velocity at that point in space would be to integrate over the velocity distribution function. So the, the point in space actually has many, many particles. Well, yeah, many, many realizations, let's say, of the same particle. Okay. okay. But the realizations come at different times, don't they? I mean, maybe that's the point that the yeah. science Well, not, I, would say not necess I would say not necessarily. You think of different systems, let's say, each with the same boundary conditions of the macroscopic system. So realizations, I think, in the same way that you talk about realizations in turbulence, and each one of these systems has a, has a velocity at a point in space. And those, those velocities at a given point in space, at a given time in the process, are going to be different. And that, that, the distribution of those velocities are what we're interested in. Yes? This is a single stream approximation. You, have a single, you don't have two particles at the same time. No, no. Single particle. Center of the particle. Uh, okay. So, in, so that this is maybe uh, less uh, well. So the number of particles per unit volume is given by the integral of f over the over the the uh, the volume in velocity space. And in terms, of, in terms of the number density, we can talk about the mass density that we're accustomed to from our study in fluid mechanics. So it's just the mass of the particle times the number of particles per unit volume. And, and an alternative measure, an alternative measure of how space is filled with the particles is called the volume fraction. And that's denoted by the, the symbol nu, Greek nu, also a function of position and time, as is the, the number density. And that's related to the number density through the volume of a single particle. So we'll be using these two symbols more or less equivalently to talk about how, how space is filled by particles, or uh, this has a more uh, dynamic significance because it uh, associates uh, space the way space is filled with the mass of the particles. Okay, and we're going to have to say something about the form of this distribution function. So we'll, we'll leave that for later. Um, so this is how we get the number density, the density, the volume fraction, but we can talk about other particle properties. Uh, Particle properties like the velocity of a particle itself, or like the, the energy of a particle. Um, and we can talk about averages over those properties making use of the velocity distribution function. So we normalize the, the, the uh, integral of that property over the single particle velocity distribution function by the number density in order to obtain that average property. So the, so the mean velocity uh, is the average over particle velocities uh, in, in exactly the way that I described in terms of property velocities. Okay, and I say we, can, we do that. There, there are many particle properties that we could apply this to. Uh, 
and one is certainly going to be the energy. And then, let's see, in a spatial volume element, the total amount, the average amount, of a particle property is the number of particles in that volume times the volume element itself, this is a vector volume element, times the average of that particle property. Excuse me? Yes. Uh, so, CZ, vector like quantity, right? C is yeah. a vector like quantity. C is a vector. And F, is F a scalar? F is a scalar. So, N, uh, uh, so N is a scalar. The third equation then is not very clear to me. So on the right hand side you have a scalar multiplied with a vector on the right hand side. And on the left hand side you have a scalar. What that? equation? This equation? Yeah, yeah. Third, yeah. This yeah. is a scalar. This is a vector volume element. And we're integrating over all components of the velocity. So you have a... And this is, then is a scalar. This is a scalar and this is a scalar. D DC is DC1, DC2, DC3. Oh, okay, okay. Is yeah. That, is, it's so a volume, that's what I mean by a volume element. So DC is not a vector. No, DC is a volume element. Oh, volume so that, you're right, that's a volume misleading element. notation. So DC is DC1, DC2, DC3. Okay, so why am I talking about, why am I talking about the mean amount of any property in a volume element? Because I'd like to write down next a, a balance equation for any property. So this so so this is this is essentially this is a trivial statement. It's just a it's just a balance equation. It's saying that given the or the, let's say it's saying the time rate of change uh, so we're we're applying this really to the fixed volume in three dimensions. a fixed volume element, and we're saying that the way that the, the, way that the average number of, or the, the uh, average amount of property C can change with time in this volume element is there could be an explicit change if the, the, uh, the property is a function of the particle velocity and there's some reason for the particle velocity to change. For example, external forces acting on the particles. So this essentially is the rate of change of the property psi if it's influenced by external forces acting through the volume element. This is the net influx, minus sign influx, because the diversion deals with outflux. So we have, so we have material coming in and going out all of the edges of this volume. So that's the significance, that's the significance of this term. And this is a production due to collisions between particles that takes place in the interior. Okay, so then these are just the, the, the right hand side are just the three possible ways that the particle property can change in this volume element. And then this relation, this relation applies when we cancel out the, the volume element from the relating, from the, from the balance. Okay, so this equation of balance is going to be the basis for our deriving the balance equations for mass, momentum, and energy. That is, those are the properties that we're going to make use of uh, in obtaining balance equations that are appropriate for each of them. Uh, and in order to do that, we're going to have to focus on this quantity here. We're going to have to characterize the collisional production of those quantities within the, within the volume. And in order to do that, we're going to have to say something about how likely a collision is between pairs of particles. Okay, so now now the calculation gets a little more complicated because what governs what governs the likelihood uh, of particle of pairs of particles colliding is something called the complete pair distribution function and 
it's more complicated than the single particle distribution function because it depends upon the velocity of the two particles that are engaging in the collision and it depends upon their positions so that they so that this complete pair distribution function when multiplied by the by the elements of volume give us the number of pairs of particles that are participating uh, in a collision okay and one thing we know is that for a pair of colliding particles their positions are related by their diameter and the, the unit vector so that just comes back that just comes back to to this situation that is what we're saying is particles colliding particles colliding have a distance between their centers uh, equal to the diameter of the particles okay so now we want to say something about the complete pair distribution function and actually what we want to do is we'd like to see how that complete pair distribution function enters into an expression for the frequency of particle collisions. Okay? So, here's how we, here's how we characterize that. Let's suppose that sphere 2 is at the point R2. And what we want to understand is is the frequency let's say given a particular direction of uh, which we'd like to determine uh, the the collision frequency and given a particular component of the relative velocity so let's fix these two items the question is given this direction and given this velocity, where do the particles, where do the particle reside, where does particle 1 reside, uh, that will, where do the particles 1 reside, that will result in a collision within a time interval dt? And the answer to that question is that the particles, the particles that are going to collide at at this point on the sphere, so the, the, the dotted circle shows the positions of centers of particle 1 that can possibly interact with particle 2, but the, the centers of spheres 1 that are going to collide with uh, particle 2 lie within a tube uh, uh, with a cylindrical cross-section uh, and and, and uh, inclined faces uh, that are perpendicular to the direction k. So the question is, so the question is, what's the what's the volume of this of this tube? And uh, the, the cross sectional area of the circular cylinder is given in terms of the uh, unit uh, unit vector. Uh, along the line of the relative velocities and its projection on k so it, so the, the this is minus k so the unit vector k projected on c12 uh, it gives us uh, gives us the cross sectional area and the height of the cylinder uh, is uh, the magnitude of the velocity c1 times the increment in time. Okay, so with this, ge with this geometric construction, we can determine the probable number of collisions in an interval dt uh, with c1 in, uh, in dc1, c2 in, D in dc2, and dk in k. And that involves then this uh, expression, which uh, is the characterization of the volume element dr1 that the that spheres one have to reside in. Okay, so this is a type of calculation that that gives kinetic theory its reputation 
as being too complicated. Okay, it's not uh, it's not a particularly deep calculation, but seeing it for the, for the first time, it's it's rather overwhelming. Okay, but well, let's take that now as a fact. And I invite you, if you're interested in it, to, to follow through the, the reasoning uh, in order to determine the probable number of, of collisions in DT. And, the, and now we'll make use of this, uh, uh, this quantity which, to lead us to, a, to an expression for the frequency of collisions. Okay, so the way we get the frequency of collision is simply divide through by dt, and uh, we'll do that on the next slide. So we ignore the, uh, in the previous calculation, we only evaluate f2 at the point of collision. The r2 is given by the r2 minus r1 equal to sigma. That's right. That's the, that's the, that's the location of spheres that are in collisions. Yeah. Yeah, so we're not... We're not obtaining the entire complete pair distribution function. We're obtaining only the complete pair distribution function for colliding pairs. Okay, so what I said is we, we need to determine this collisional production in order to be able to write the balance equations for the properties that, that we're interested in. So, um, that's not so challenging here. So what we're in, it's in order to get the collisional produ production of some property, uh, we take the change in that property at the position of particle two in a collision, and make use of the expression from the previous slide after dividing through by the by the uh, <coughs> element dt. So this is the frequency. This is the frequency of collisions. And this is the change in property in a given, in a given collision. So the, so, the, so the entire expression is the rate of change of that property per unit volume. Well, the per unit volume comes because we, not only have we divided out, not only have we divided out the time, but we've also divided out the volume element that contains R2. Okay. So how does that feel to you? Is everybody ready for a short quiz? <laughs> okay. But, so we've achieved our purpose, if you like. We've got an expression We've got an expression for the, the rate of collisional production. All the other terms in that expression, in the equation of balance, are given explicitly in terms of the averages of the properties. Here it's the average of the derivative of the property with respect to C. Here's the average of the property. Uh, so this really was the only uh, mysterious component of that. And now we seem to have to have been able to say something about that, but of course, of course, we're we're not going to do we're not going to be able to do anything unless we propose or somehow obtain the functions f1, the single particle velocity distribution function, and and this function f2, the complete pair distribution function for particles that are colliding. Okay? But, before we do that, we're going to do one more calculation in order to give us a, a decomposition of the collisional production into a divergence term and into a, what is called a, a, a source term. Okay, why do we do that? Well, if we're talking about momentum, for example, uh, this collisional production of momentum can be decomposed into a divergence of a collisional stress and an additional term. In the case of momentum, it turns out the additional term is zero. Uh, on the other hand, we're dealing with the, with the uh, collisional production of energy, 
this collisional production can roughly be decomposed into a, a divergence of an energy flux and a collisional dissipation of energy. Okay, so that, so that uh, there's precedent now for making a decomposition of this collisional production into two contributions. All right, and this is and this is what I'm doing here. And the way I do this is, so I've looked at this collision. Let's say the collision has particle one here, particle two here. I say, let's look at it, the same collision, but let's translate the, the colliding pair slightly. Let's go in, in minus sigma k uh, direction. And so now I'm looking at, I'm looking at what is essentially the identical collision. That is, C12 is the same, uh, uh, and the geometry of the collision is the same. But what is different is that uh, the, the collisional distribution function is slightly different because the, the positions of the centers of the two particles are different. And also, the, 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 property, uh, at, uh, the property at position R2 in this new collision is associated with the velocity of particle one. So that's expressed here. That is, in this, in this slightly shifted collision, the property has changed to be associated with particle one, and then the distribution function has changed in terms of the positions of the particles. Okay, so I have, if you like, I have two, uh, uh, almost equivalent expressions for the collisional production. And what I'll do is I'll make them equivalent by using a Taylor series to expand, to express this complete pair distribution function in terms of this complete pair distribution function and a derivative where the derivative is evaluated at the, at the uh, appropriate uh, centers of the original collision. So I, I carry out this expansion in this model, and I take half the sum of this one and this one and this one uh, in order to get a decomposed collisional dissipation that has now a, a divergence operator that comes from the Taylor series that I've carried out here, a, an article, uh, uh, a, an integrand that is simply the difference in the properties of particle one uh, after and before collisions, while the second term involves the, what is called the total change of property psi in the collision between two particles. That is, It is sensitive to this difference and to this difference when we take the half the sum and divide. Yes. So with phi one dash and phi one are these averages of the physical properties? Say this again. Please. Phi one dash and phi one. Phi one. Sorry, sorry. 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 Yeah, sorry. No. no, those are the, they're, as they appear in the integrands. These are the particle properties at a particular point in physical and space, velocity, space, and time. So they depend on the single particle distribution function for that particle at that place. No, they're properties of the individual particles. Okay, so they, they're, they're, they, they depend upon, the, let's say, the velocity of particle one, the velocity of particle two. The averaging, the averaging comes in here through the complete pair distribution function. So, the, so the, the, these integrals are really the marriage of what's happening in a single collision between two particles with respect to whatever property is important and the probabilistic descri description of the, uh, the likelihood of a collision. So, so psi 1 is a thing like half mc1 squared or something like that? Yeah, yes. 
Well, psi, psi 1 would be C1, if I'm dealing with momentum, for example. Okay? Then the psi, psi 1 might be M C1. That's momentum. It could be 1 half M C1 squared. Then it's energy. It could even be 1. It could be 1, and then we're, we're generating a collisional production of mass. Okay? So, I mean, perhaps I should have been more explicit about what the property is, because just talking about it as a property may make it mysterious. But what we're going to do once we, or what we could do at any stage, is say, let's take psi, let's take psi to be unity, and then we're going to get a collisional production of mass. Let's take psi to be the particle velocity times, ma times mass, and we're going to get a collisional production of momentum. Let's take it to be 1 half mc1 squared, or mc2 squared, we're going to get a collisional production of energy. Okay? So that's, that's effectively what's happening. Okay, so the, and the interesting thing then about this integrand is that this is the total change of this property psi in a collision. So it, it deals with the, with the amount of psi associated both with particle 2 and particle 1. So, for example, if I'm talking about momentum, as the property. If I talk about momentum, because momentum is conserved in the collision between two particles, this is this integral is zero. The integrand is zero. Okay? So there's no collisional production of, of uh, or no source of momentum. All of the, the entire collisional production of momentum then resides in this divergence term. And this, then, we're going to be identifying eventually with the collisional contribution to the stress tensor. So this is where the this is where the stress then enters into the into the theory. Okay, and so that so the generic balance equation now is written in terms of the divergence contribution to the collisional production and the source, and the the source is zero whenever we're dealing with a property that's conserved in a collision. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. If we, uh, if instead of doing uh, granular particles, we were doing particles of zero size, no, there was no diameter. Yeah. Like uh, molecular gas. Yes. There is diameter, but you don't uh, distinguish between R1 and R2 there in the collision because they are supposed to be so small. Yes, yeah, so these terms that I'm so focused on mm -hmm. here don't appear in a, in a kinetic theory for particles that don't have significant size. So in that case, the first term, will it still remain? The del dot theta term, the flux? No. No, in the balance law, all the, all the, so you wouldn't have these terms at all. Your balance law for this, so that's a typical dilute gas. No, I mean, if you had an inelastic gas, but the size was small, then you would not have the del dot theta term. In the collisional production... Oh, you, you say you, you could still have collisional production because the collision was still dissipated. Yes, you're case. right. Okay. Yeah. So, so I guess the image I was trying for myself was that the first term, the one with theta, is happening because in a collision, the property is kind of transferred from one physical. Well, so let me let me do let's talk about that explicitly because I was going to say something about that later, but uh, let's say let's say something about it now. So just imagine this is a surface in the flow, and there are two ways to transfer momentum across the surface. That is, this sphere let's say originally below the surface, takes its momentum through the surface and then perhaps collides with a particle above the surface and transfers its momentum. So this is, a, this is the, the classical way I think you might see viscosity described of in, in textbooks, or certainly in a, in, a, in a gas, this is the dominant mode of momentum transfer, okay? But there's a second mode of momentum transfer when the, when the particle, uh, when, the, when the volume fraction, when the density, when the concentration is higher. And that is a direct transfer. 
across a direct transfer through collisions across this surface. Okay? So the center of this particle in this direct transfer doesn't have to doesn't cross the surface. But in this kind of in this collision, it transfers its momentum across the surface. Okay? And what we're doing here is I'm as I focus as I focus on the on the dense flows, we're we're eliminating. I mean at the moment it's still incorporated in, in the theory, but eventually I'm going to throw out the transfers that are associated with particles moving across the surface because in a dense flow this mechanism of momentum transfer is far more likely. Okay? And, that, and really that's why the, the simplification, that's why the, the theory for a dense flow is simplified. is because the momentum transfers all have to do with particle transfers that uh, that are occurring between particles that are rather close together. So I, maybe I should have been more explicit. So the kind of the, the theories I'm talking about are for volume fractions of solid particles, let's say between 30 and 50 percent. That's that's a pretty significant volume fraction. Now let's say by way of comparison, if you have a gas of spheres. Uh, at a concentration of 10%, the distance between their edges on average is one particle diameter. So even at 10%, that's a rather dense uh, situation. That is, it would be hard to see through a flow of that, of that gas if, if it were anything more than 10 particles thick. Okay? So I'm, I'm starting with even denser situations, 30% to 50%. And at 50 percent, the kind of theory that I'm going to be introducing next breaks down, and I'll say something about the, the, the breakdown of the theory. Okay, so, so where are we? We've got, a balance, we've got an equation of balance for some property, and of course the properties are going to be mass, momentum, and energy. Uh, it, it has this explicit production term, it has this, uh, this flux, and this flux really has to do this flux has this flux has to do with this mechanism, part with flow of that property through the surfaces of our of our element. Okay, so that that here is a term that if I'm going to be focusing on dense flows, I'm going to be ignoring. But now I've managed to characterize the the the, the two parts of a collisional production of these properties. Okay, well, so here we are. So now let's look at the special cases that relate to various properties. So if we take, for mass, we take the property to be M. M, the, this property then is independent of the velocity. So the first term in the balance law doesn't appear. Um, what else? Uh, mass is conserved, so the, the last term in the balance law doesn't appear. So what I'm saying is, is that for mass, uh, this term is zero, and for mass, this term is zero, so this is zero, and this term is zero, the mass of particle one isn't changed in the collision. So mass is kind of mass is kind of simple. It only involves it only involves the divergence term, and we can write this in terms of the of the convective derivative if we like, in order to obtain a, the familiar form of mass balance. So rho is the mass per unit volume of the of the particle gas. All right, so that's encouraging, and we get the the mass balance is form that we're accustomed to from maybe our study of, of fluid mechanics. Uh, let's take for momentum, uh, we'll take the property to be mass times the velocity. And, and here again, now we're going to be getting contributions 
we're going to be get we're going to get a contribution here because the momentum of particle one changes in the collision. We're not going to get a contribution here because the momentum of the system of two particles is conserved. Okay, and let's see. And for momentum, for momentum, I is mass times the velocity. So this term is simply the mass, and dc dt is is the force per unit mass. So we're going to get a contribution here to the momentum balance that has to do with any external forces that are being uh, applied to the particle. For example, gravity. Okay, so what do we have? So we have the external force. We've got this contribution from the change in momentum. So now this is meant to be a tensor product uh, in dealing with this vector property. And here is the collision frequency again. Uh, and what I've done is, that is, this, this term typically, or this term is arising, this term is arising from this term, but what I've done is I've, I've used the difference in the velocity, I've used the, what I call the velocity fluctuation, the difference in the velocity from the average velocity at that point to write the to write the divergence term in terms of the velocity fluctuation and then use the rest of the contribution to write this in the form of the, of the convective derivative of the velocity. So the, the, interesting, the interesting news here is that, is that the momentum balance has a form that we're familiar with and it looks like we identify then the total stress as this collisional pressure tensor, so I have to emphasize that in the context of the kinetic theory, we deal with the pressure tensor rather than the stress tensor. It, it, the, the momentum balance includes the divergence of this collisional contribution, this contribution here, and also it involves this contribution, which is this contribution here. So at this stage, we have both contributions to the momentum transfer. Particles flying over the surface area element and particles colliding on either side of it. And, and this we can calculate, provided we have some information about this guy. All right, so that's what we'll turn to next. We've got our balance equations. Well. I'm sorry, there's one more balance equation that I'm interested in, and that's really a balance equation for the magnitude of this guy, or the square of the magnitude of this guy. And that's related to the energy of the velocity fluctuations. Okay, and I say we need that, we need that balance, we need that balance equation for the, for the velocity fluctuations. So, this is something that, in the language of the subject, is called the granular temperature. It's simply the, it's one-third the square of the fluctuation velocity. Uh, and the way we get that is to use, as the particle property, the, the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy of the various particles. And it turns out, you now here's a calculation that I won't go into, but it's it, it, it turns out that if you use that, if you use that in the in the uh, in the expressions for the for the flux and the source, that uh, that the flux decomposes into the working of the mean velocity on the collisional pressure tensor and another quantity, uh, another quantity that involves the difference <coughs> in the squares of the, of the uh, velocity fluctuations of particle one. Okay, and if you go through calculations that are similar to those that we did for the momentum balance, we get an equation of balance for this measure. 
of the strength of the velocity fluctuations uh, that involves a, a flux of energy associated with particles moving between collisions and a flux of energy that is associated with particles colliding and also the working of this total stress that has two parts through the gradients of the average velocity and one more term which has to do with the rate of collisional dissipation of energy. So this is a source term for the energy. It's a source term for the energy that isn't present in the kinetic theory for molecular gases because molecular particles collide without any loss of energy. This is direct, This term is directly related to the loss of energy in a collision between two, two particles. Okay, so, so there is our energy balance. And I say it has, it has a structure that you may be uh, acquainted with if you, if you uh, are acquainted with the structure of an energy balance in a, in a gas or in a liquid. It's, a, it's the internal energy, which in this case is very simple. Uh, the time rate of change of the internal energy uh, associated with the velocity fluctuations is the divergence of the flux of energy minus the working of the stress through the gradients and mean velocity. And I say in molecular theory, this, this term is not present. So this is a new term associated with the fact that collisions are dissipated. And once again, we can calculate, we can calculate all of these quantities that appear in the balance law once we're able to say something about the probability of a collision. Yes? What is the uh, operation this P dot ready between those two tensors? P what is this? Is that, that what you is that? Uh, C tensor T acting on dot radial. On so this is a second rank tensor, right? Tensor product with the gradient of the mean velocity, and the, I'm sorry, and then the trace is to sum the diagonal components of that tensor product, of that matrix product. Between those two tensors, what is the operation? C tensor T? Between this and this. Just tensor multiplication or matrix multiplication. How do you want? Would it be would it be better if I did it initially in, in terms of indices? Does that make sense? Doesn't look like it does. <laughs> That's the whole thing. That's the trace rate. That's the trace. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's the whole thing. So it would be <coughs> something like that. Okay. And then you sum over i and k to get the trace. But th this is a term that is also present in the energy equation for a Newtonian fluid. Oh, I, you know, it's not so unfamiliar. Maybe I've written it in an unfamiliar way. Anything else? Uh, is there a reason that we did not write the moment of momentum? I mean, that we stopped that momentum? I'm dealing with frictionless particles. Yeah, so the, the idea of having to employ moment of momentum is... Uh, is empty for, as long as we're not taking into account the rotational degrees of freedom of the spheres. Okay? And in fact, if I were to take into account the rotational degrees of freedom of the spheres, I would have another contribution to the energy from the rotational energy. Okay? So that creates a nightmare because you've got two more balance equations to deal with. One to tell you, oh, so. I was wondering about the symmetry of stress. I mean, so we don't know, I mean, like in usual continuum mechanics, but here we don't have any information. Well, it's going to turn out that the, the calculation of the stress is, is going to deliver us something that is symmetric. identically symmetric. Yeah, so we don't have to write down a balance equation for that and show that that 
leads to the uh, okay. But I mean, but you raise an interesting issue: is what happens when you take into account the tangential interaction? And in fact, the answer is you have two more balance equations to deal with. You could derive it exactly the same way as we as we've done here, but the interaction between those two particles is going to be more complicated because of the tangential component. Okay, so now I think I want to say something about the F2, this collisional probability. Oh, so here I, I, I'm here I'm making the, the point that I made here is that I want to I want to I, for for the dense collisional flows I want to retain these interactions and throw out the in, the the more dilute interactions. So that means that the terms, the terms that I've indicated as being as black here, are out. Get rid of them. I want only collisional terms. So, well, forget this contribution to the to the pressure. Okay. So that's the simplification then that is associated with the dense systems. And I as Maybe I said earlier in answer to Ishan's question, in the in the standard kinetic theory for dilute molecular gases, the terms that I'm throwing out are really the only terms that are present. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm talking about a kinetic theory that is really non-classical in 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 that sense. Okay. All right, so here's the situation then. If we're focusing now on dense collisional flows, here's our set of the balance equation. So they're looking simpler. They're looking simpler. Um, there's really nothing to calculate here for the mass balance. We've got to calculate the, the, the pressure tensor for the momentum balance, and we have to have given to us what, uh, what the applied force might be. And I say typically it's gravity. So it's not so mysterious. Uh, here's the energy balance. The energy balance now has a structure, it may be familiar from your previous studies, except we have a new term here that has to do with the change in the total energy in a collision. Okay, for molecular gases, this change in total energy is zero. But for our dense gas, we have a a change in total energy that's related to the coefficient of restitution. Now, the, the fact that we have this term here is interesting in this that if we had, let's suppose we're, we're talking about a nice, we're talking about a homogeneous shearing flow, so we don't have any spatial gradients that we're dealing with in, in, in terms of the divergence here, and if we have a shearing flow, then this quantity is is constant, so that uh, the fact that this term is present in a granular gas means that this energy equation can have a steady solution. That is, both of these terms can be zero. Okay? On the other hand, if we were dealing with a molecular gas, this term is not present. So if we have a, even if we have a homogeneous flow, this term then will constantly contribute to the raising of the temperature. Okay, so a, a Newtonian gas or a Newtonian fluid sheared homogeneously is going to have a temperature <coughs> that goes up. But the granular gas can have a steady solution. So in the in the incline flow that we're, we're talking about, we could have a steady solution. Although in that incline flow, the, the, there's typically a gradient of the of the energy. Okay, next. I'm going to check my time. Fifteen minutes. How much? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen. Yeah. You can stop. Okay. So, what about this guy? What can we say about him?
Well, the classical assumption is you relate the complete pair distribution function to the single particle velocity distribution functions. So you say that there, uh, that there are no correlations between the velocity c1 and velocity c2. That is, they, they contribute independently to the probability of collision. And there, there may be a factor that's uh, uh, associated with the spatial uh, distribution of uh, particles that participate in the collision. Okay, the important thing here is, to, is, is this, contribu this uh, multiplicative contribution of the single particle velocity distribution functions. Okay, so that's fine. So I've, so I've, I've been able to relate uh, this, the pair distribution function to the single particle velocity distributions and some function of their position. Uh, so let me go even further. I'm going to take the velocity. So now I'm now I'm making a uh, an important assumption about about the probabilities. But the assumption I'm making is perhaps the simplest I could make. That is, I'm I'm assuming that the velocity distribution functions are of an exponential type, and this exp and the exponential velocity distribution contains three parameters that are governed by the balance equations. So I'm making, so I'm introducing this velocity distribution function parameterized by the quantities that the balance equations govern, and in that way I'm closing the system of equations. So if I use the, if I use the velocity, this velocity distribution function to, ca to carry out the averages, I'm going to have a closed system. And I make a particularly simple uh, assumption for the prefactor in this uh, complete pair distribution function. And I assume it to be a function that's determined in numerical simulations of, of, um, of elastic granular gases, molecular gases. So this is, a, this is a correction that was first introduced by Enskog in the kinetic theory, or a correction of this type to, to the uh, assumption of molecular chaos. Molecular, they make the assumption of molecular chaos in the kinetic theory for dilute gases, but there isn't this, there isn't this numerical factor here. This, this numerical factor comes from the, from the uh, from the point that uh, when you have when you have spherical particles that are at a density that is significant, they they uh, they intrude upon one another as they make make collisions. The the volume that they occupy is a is a significant volume uh, of the space. So that so that this factor uh, introduces a way of modeling. Uh, the volumes excluded by the particles in their interactions with one another. If you have a dilute gas of particles, as Isha mentioned earlier, all you will care about is the, where the centers of the particles are. When you have a more when you have a more dense arrangement of particles, <coughs> it's not the particle centers that dictate the frequency of collisions as much as it's the distance between the edges of the particles. And this factor introduces a correction for that, for that effect. Okay, so, so I'm going to make use of this velocity distribution function for that of particle 1 and a similar one for that of particle 2. I'm going to I'm going to use this correction factor, which is a function of the volume fraction. Now, you might say, well, what is, what's this special volume fraction of 0 0.64? 0 0.64 is the volume fraction for close packing, close 
random packing of identical spheres. Okay, so the singularity is taken to be is taken to be the, uh, where the where the uh, system is at close random packing. On average, all the particles are touching, so that consequently, the frequency of collision is going to infinity there. Okay, so it, with with this assumption, the complete pair distribution function is given in terms of the velocity of the mean velocity of the center of particle one, the mean velocity of the part, center of particle two, uh, the uh, granular temperature at the center of particle one, the granular temperature at the center of particle two, and the number densities at those centers. Okay, so now we come to a step that makes the kinetic theory for dense systems simple. And, well, <laughs> I, I can't pretend to say it's simple, but simplifies it over having to solve for velocity distribution function. So what we do is in this, in this complete pair distribution function, we, we carry out a Taylor series expansion and express the, these quantities not at the centers of their particular particles, but at the point of contact between the two particles. Okay, and in doing that, that introduces spatial gradients. And, the, and introducing spatial gradients in this way is going to introduce spatial gradients in the expressions of the energy flux and the, and the pressures. So we're generating our constitutive relations by doing a Taylor series of the, of the complete pair distribution function. Okay, so here is the, here is the expression, here is the expression for the complete pair distribution function in terms of this gradient and in terms of these Maxwellian functions with the mean fields evaluated at the point of contact of the collision. Okay, and remember, in order to get the constituent of relations, we have to carry out these intervals. And now, what we do is we simply substitute that, those, that form of the complete pair distribution function and carry out these intervals. Okay? Now, the problem with the, the, the problem with carrying out the integral is that it's a three, six, eight dimensional integration that you're carrying it out. So, uh, it's, there's another place where the kinetic theory becomes a little bit overwhelming. Okay, but people have been carrying out these integrals for a long time, so there are tables of integration that you can employ in order to do it. Uh, and in addition to providing you with the PDF, I, I'm going to apply, I'm going to, I guess I mentioned this earlier, uh, I'll, I'll give you a copy of paper by Savage and myself, where the appendix contains a table of integrations that you can use to go through these integrations. So, so they're daunting at first glance, but once you go through them, they're just integrations. Okay, so we go through the, we, we do the integrations, and this is what results. We get an expression for the energy flux that involves the gradient of the temperature. I say this gradient was introduced by our Taylor series expansion. And the coefficient, which you might identify as the coefficient of thermal conductivity, is given as a function of quantities that are going to be determined, the mass density, uh, the volume fraction nu times our, the radial distribution function at collision, that's the name of this guy, G0, which is a known function of nu, the particle diameter, and the square root of the granular temperature over pi. So, so the, the point is, Q depends upon the mean fields that we're going to determine. Well, at least two of them. Depend, depends on nu, or alternatively rho, and T. Uh, the rate of dissipation, similarly. It depends upon this function. In addition, as we 
No, it must. It depends upon the coefficient of restitution. The, the, the further away the coefficient of restitution is from unity, the more, the greater the rate of dis dissipation. And also, again, there's a, an additional functional dependence on the temperature here. And finally, the pressure tensor contains three contributions, really. It contains uh, a contribution. So this is the unit tensor. Here's the unit tensor here. It contains a, a contribution that, when employed with, with kappa, it gives a contribution that's proportional to the temperature and a function of nu. So this is a, a thermodynamic pressure, if you like. That is, it depends only upon the temperature, not upon the rate of shearing. Uh, here is a dilatational viscosity. This depends upon the trace of the symmetric part of the velocity gradients. Uh, so, so that's a, perhaps an uncommon contribution if you're focused on uh, Navier-Stokes gases and liquids. Uh, but uh, that's a viscosity associated with volume changes. And here, essentially, is, a, is a, 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 the viscosity associated with shearing. So that the pressure depends upon spatial gradients of the average velocity. What's the first term? What is the first term? This gives, this gives a contribution which is a function of concentration times the temperature. So that is a dense gas pressure. Okay, independent of the velocity gradients. Okay. And it's fluctuation driven pressure. Fluctuation driven pressure. Okay, so these particles by, in, by colliding with one another are generating a pressure. Okay, and if we're shearing them with respect to one another, the transfers of momentum are generating stresses. Okay, and I said that we needed the temperature because this, the analog of the thermal conductivity, did, well, more importantly, let's say, through kappa, kappa here, uh, the viscosity is a is an explicit function of the temperature. So we have to carry the temperature along in order to be able to, to describe the viscosity of the fluid. So this dense collisional gas of nearly identical, nearly elastic spheres behaves as the analog of a compressible, heat conducting, linearly viscous fluid. So yeah. this is a kappa <coughs> equation. So kappa, you are identifying with viscosity. Right? No, no. Well, kappa is the viscosity. Yes. It turns out the thermal conductivity and the viscosity in this theory are the same. Is that is, is that easy to understand? I mean, thermal conductivity and viscosity. I don't know how much do they differ in a viscous fluid or a gas. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm not a fluid person. Yeah. Probably there's something. Yeah. So uh, in a in a case where uh, in the usual Navier Stokes, yes. the first term would simply be a P zero. It would be a thermodynamic pressure. Yeah. Oh, just that, right? Yes. Yeah. And typically in a, in a Navier Stokes fluid, you don't have a volume of viscosity because Stokes hypothesis says that. The only contribution to the isotropic part of the stress is the thermodynamic pressure. Jim, in some sense, when you're saying that thermodynamic uh, kappa is same as viscosity, is it like uh, similar to like the Pantel number being one approximation without bothering about CPM? You know? Well, it's, it, yeah, except it's in the context of this theory, it's not an approximation, it's a result. So that, yeah, but in this theory, yes, the, the two are the same. So the transport coefficients are independent of the coefficient of restitution, right? That's because of the limit you have Well, it's because of the nearly elastic assumption that I made. Now, that's a good point, too. If I gave up that nearly elastic assumption, then the coefficient of restitution is going to be playing a much greater role in the theory, and it's going to enter all the transport coefficients. And in that case, the thermal, the thermal conductivity is different from the viscosity because they depend upon the coefficient of restitution in different ways. Um.
So, and as a second follow-up, but the first diisotropic contribution to the pressure tensor, that's not rho kt because you are looking only at uh, near collisions, is it? it? Unlike a dilute gas. It is rho kt. No. There is a rho. You no, that is a t to the half, right? And then kappa has well, t, t to the half here and t to the half oh, here. It's, so it's identical to, that part is identical. Yeah, yes. Yeah, identical to a dense gas. A uh, molecule. Multiplied by some correction factor. Um, because of the pair position, right? Let's see. I mean, so the, I mean, the question would be how different? I mean, this is going to be different from that for a dilute gas because it only involves the collisional terms. Because here you have the n score correction put in, is it? Is yeah, that's what I mean. Exactly. Yeah. At what stage did we get rid of the E? At what stage did we get rid of the coefficient of association? In the heat, you mean the heat transfer? Somewhere, there, there was 1 minus E everywhere and then it seems to have vanished. Well, it's not 1 minus E everywhere. I mean, it's yeah. only 1 minus E. In gamma. It's in only gamma. 1 minus E. In gamma. Let's see, when you're, when you're characterizing the change in total energy. Okay. I mean, one minus e appears at lowest order. Okay, and higher order, I say e is going to be appearing elsewhere. No, because you made a comment that if you were to retain e not close to one, then the transport coefficients would depend on e. That yes, they would. How would they come in? That? Well, they, they would depend upon e. Let's see. I have to be careful. I don't say something wrong here. In that case, when we're talking about transfer, we're talking about transfer and the, the interaction. So we're talking about C1 prime minus C1. In fact, if you do the calculation using the two particles and the, and, and the flux, of, it's going to turn out that in any, every collisional term for energy and for momentum, there's a 1 plus E factor. And so here, this assumption of nearly elastic, I replaced a 1 plus e by 2. Because that's has been that's done. That's what yeah, that's, that's one place. Another place is the, in the, in the, in this collisional dissipation, for the same reason, in a, in a more dissipative situation, this 1 minus e would be replaced by 1 minus e squared <coughs> over 2. Okay, so it appears at least in those, at least in those ways. So, but I've not seen you doing expansion, so I was wondering where we lost. No, I should have said that. But that, that's, that's, I really didn't explain where the assumption nearly elastic came in. And that's where it comes in. Okay. Yeah. All right, so what do we have? So we have a system, I mean, with, with these, uh, let me call them constitutive relations. Now I've got, I've got this relation, I've got this relation, and I've got this relation. Now, I can, I can use those relations in this system of equations, and I've got, a, I've got something I can solve. I've got a closed system of equations for rho, u, and t. Okay? And so that's what I'll do in the next lecture, is I'll, I'll provide solutions to those equations. Uh, and, and then maybe talk a little bit about how this theory... Oh, maybe I can say that now, if you're not too exhausted. Um, so the question is, I said this theory works between 30% and roughly 50 percent. Uh, but why doesn't it work between 50 percent and 64 percent? And that is because this assumption of molecular chaos begins to break down. And you have to, you have to somehow try to repair that breakdown of, of this assumption. And it's not, it's not very easy. I mean, it's not very easy to 
repair it in the context of the, of the kinetic theory. So we've, said, so we've, we've made some assumptions here that are pretty simple, but the problem is improving upon that assumption is pretty hard. Okay, but I'll describe phenomenological ways to try to deal with that range of concentrations between 50% and, let's say, 64% in uh, my next lecture. What, Thank you. What about binary collisions? Bi well, binary collisions, binary collisions breaking down, that's molecular chaos breaking down. Too.